This morning we continue in our study of the introduction uh, to the book of Romans. And the introduction to the book of Romans is, is much like an overture in a musical. In Broadway musicals, the overture is played in the beginning before the musical actually starts. It is an instrumental selection containing brief segments from more popular songs in the musical, introducing them to the audience in anticipation for what follows. Today, we have a gospel overture. There are four movements in this overture to introduce us to the gospel as it's going to be more fully developed later on in the book of Romans. It's just a, a tidbit, if you will. It's an introduction to the great themes that are contained in the book of Romans. There are four movements, as I said. The first movement in the, in the Gospel Overture introduces us to Paul's passion with respect to the Gospel. We saw that Paul was very passionate about the Gospel last week because he was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he was called to be an apostle, and because he was separated unto that gospel. The second movement is the promise of the gospel, that it was given in the Old Testament and brought to pass through the person of the Lord Jesus. The third movement is what we're going to be considering this morning, and that is the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel. Why did God give us the gospel? Why was Paul set apart for the gospel? If you look at Romans 1.5, it says, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. So from verse 5, we find out that the purpose of the gospel is twofold. First, the purpose of the gospel is to bring about mankind's obedience to God. The purpose of the gospel is to bring about mankind's obedience to God. Notice verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship, now these words, to bring about the obedience of faith. The structure of the phrase, the obedience of faith, is a genitive and could be understood in two different ways. The first way to understand the phrase is that it means the obedience that consists of faith. In other words, the obedience that is being referred to is faith. By faith, you are obedient to God, and that is the purpose of the gospel. The second way is to understand the phrase to mean the obedience that comes from faith, that is, the obedience that faith produces. Now that might seem like a pretty trite distinction, but it's actually extremely important in the book of Romans. And the difference is not purely academic. Let me give you some quotes to help you understand the significance of the difference. For example, Robert Haldane in his commentary entitled An Exposition of Romans states the following, and I quote, Paul as an apostle was commissioned to preach the gospel in order to the obedience of faith. Some understand this of the obedience which faith produces. But the usual import of the expression as well as the connection in this place, determines it to apply to the belief of the gospel. Obedience is no doubt an effect produced by that belief, but the office of an apostle was in the first place to persuade men to believe the gospel. This is the grand object, which includes the other. Gospel reforms those who believe it, but... It would be presenting an imperfect view of the subject to say that it was given to reform the world. It was given that man might believe and be saved. He says it is wrong to view that the 
gospel was given to transform the world. It wasn't to bring about obedience that results from faith. He says it was given that men might believe and be saved. The gospel is about how your sins can be forgiven and how you can go to heaven. In contrast, Robert Mounts, in his commentary, the the, uh, pillar commentary, states this. The universal scope of the gospel is expressed in Paul's definition of his task, calling people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. The promised Messiah did not come for the benefit of the Jewish nation alone, The gospel is good news for all who respond in faith. But faith inevitably issues in obedience. Faith is not intellectual assent to a series of propositions, but surrender to the one who asks us to trust in him. To surrender is to obey. Biblical faith is not some mild assent to a collection of ethical maxims, but an active commitment of one's life. Obedience is the true measure of a person's faith. He best comments that faith and obedience go inextricably together. Only in obedience is their faith. For faith is not emotional feeling or intellectual acceptance, but active response to the person. Paul's desire was to take the gospel to the entire world and see the nations turn to God in a faith that changes conduct. And the other response would be inadequate. Apart from a changed life, there is no real faith. So the question is a very significant one at the heart of the issue is the gospel about how to get to heaven or is the gospel about how people can come into a right relationship with God the SV study Bible sides with the interpretation that it is the obedience that produces faith if you have an ESV study Bible your note says this Paul's mission to all people groups his goal to bring about the obedience of faith obedience is required but it is an obedience that flows from saving faith and is always connected to ongoing faith. Although Paul can speak of people's initial response as obeying the gospel, it is unlikely that obedience of faith here refers only to initial saving faith because the purpose of God's apostleship was not merely to bring people to conversion, but also to bring about transformed lives that were consistently obedient to God. Paul's ultimate goal in preaching to the Gentiles is for the sake of his name. That is, Jesus Christ, that he will be glorified. We are not questioning whether or not the gospel includes that great hope of eternal life and being with God in heaven. Certainly that is a part of the gospel, but it's not the whole gospel. And it isn't even the primary emphasis of the gospel. The primary emphasis of the gospel is that there is a world of disobedience, that there's a world of sinfulness, that there's a world of people living in rebellion towards God, and how can that people get right with God? Not merely being forgiven, but being delivered from their sins. I believe that distinction is very important, and uh, I'm going to unpack that in the next couple of phrases. The second purpose of the gospel is to bring glory to God. For notice the end of verse 5. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name above all nations. Let me also just go back and say that the NIV translates Romans 1.5 this way. Through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. So the NIV translates it that way, the obedience that comes from faith. Faith brings about obedience. The purpose of the gospel ultimately is for God's namesake. It's to bring honor and glory to him. That is the ultimate purpose of God's redemptive work. 
It brings glory to God for the sake of his name in keeping with God's word. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. God is keeping his word. God is working out what he said he would always do. Six times in the book of Romans, it refers to God's promise. The scripture is very, very clear that God is keeping his word. God is keeping his promise. When we get to the doctrine of election, it is very concerned. What is the promise? What did God promise when he promised that people would be saved? What had he promised concerning Jacob and Esau? What had he said he would do? Romans is all about the fact that God does what he says he will do. So God is glorified through the gospel. But we're also to see that God is glorified as lives are transformed. God is not glorified by lives that are not transformed. Romans 2.23, one of the accusations against the Jewish people is this. You boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. You don't glorify God. You boast in the law. You talk about commitment to the law, but you break the law, and in such you dishonor God. You do not glorify him. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do you refer to me as Lord, but don't do as I say? Jesus was concerned for his namesake. That which we refer to Jesus as being true. Now let me unfold this a little further and talk to you about the significance here. And that is what God has called us to. If you look at verse 6. Including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 7. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. This is an introduction. This is the premise. This is the statement of the theme. All right? So the purpose is to bring obedience of faith, which I think is obedience that, that comes from or results from faith, to the glory of God. And that it includes you who are called to do to be and to do two things, to belong to Jesus Christ and to be saints. The word saints is literally holy ones. Another word that is used in English for the word holy is to be sanctified, to be set apart, to be holy. And there are two aspects of sanctification or holiness. First, there is what is often referred to as positional holiness or objective sanctification. That is, we who are sinners are made to be holy in God's sight. Our sins are forgiven, and we are declared righteous due to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's Romans 3 through 5. That is very true. We are sinners. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. We need to be made righteous. By the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, there is this imputed righteousness. His righteousness counts towards us. He took upon himself our sin. We received his righteousness. That is positional sanctification. We are holy in his sight. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Then there is what is referred to as practical holiness <clears throat> or subjective sanctification. That is, we actually begin to live holy lives. There is a transformation of life. We are different after we come to know Christ as Lord and Savior than we were before we knew Christ as Lord and Savior. We become more Christ-like, if you will. So we ask the question about verse 7, when it says we're called to be saints, what does that mean? In what sense are we called to be saints? 
There are those that would say that that speaks entirely of, of objective positional sanctification. We're called to be holy in having placed our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. So we're called to, to have faith in Jesus as our Savior. We're called to be positionally right with God. Well, certainly we are called to that. Certainly that is true. The question is, is that all we are called to? Are we simply called to place your faith in Jesus so that positionally you can be righteous to the glory of God? Or have we been called to place our faith in Jesus Christ so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we can be positionally righteous before God in a right relationship with him, and then called to live a holy life? Are we called to this life of subjective, personal obedience to God? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at how the word called is used in the book of Romans. And we don't have to look at too many places. The first place we're introduced to the word called is in Romans 1.1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. An apostle, as we looked at last week, is a sent one, a person with a commission. Paul was given a commission. He was a sent one. Uh, he was separated unto the gospel. All of that we looked at last week. When it says that he was called to be an apostle, was that simply... objective calling. Did that simply mean that he was called to the position of an apostle? Was he called to the position of apostle? Of course he was. There's no question. Paul was called to be an apostle. But when he says that he was called to be an apostle, does that mean that he was simply called to a position of which there was no action, of which there was no activity, of which there was no involvement? Was he called to be a sent one so that he could just sit? Was he called to be a sent one so that he could have a relationship with God that didn't manifest itself in any practical way. No, Paul says that he was called to be an apostle, and then he goes on to talk about how he was separated in the gospel of God. We turn to Romans chapter 15, saw how he was spreading the gospel through various areas, and fully preached the gospel at Illyricum, it said. He said he'd been hindered to coming to them up until now because he had places to go to preach the gospel. When Paul was called, he was called not just to a position, but a position that was then empowered and enabled by God to fulfill the purpose for which he was called. I submit to you the same is true of us. We are called to a position. We're called to a place of holiness before God so that we can be acceptable in his sight, so that we can be found pleasing to him. But we are not called to a position just so that we can sit there and enjoy this position of being right with God, but now we are called to subjectively live our lives under God's authority and obedience, to actually be holy people. Let's look at the only other place that the word called is found. It's found in Romans chapter 8. If you turn with me there. Probably the two, or at least one, of the most famous verses in the Bible. Most people know John 3.16. I would say Romans 8.28 is a close second. I'm going to be reading it from the ESV. Probably a lot of you memorized it in the King James. I did, and many of you have. But Romans 8.28, ESV. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to or in keeping with his purpose. So here is this statement that all things work together for those who are called of God. Those who are called according to his purpose. That takes us all the way back to this introduction. But notice what that purpose is in verse 29. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> many brothers, not many brethren. Okay. Um, the firstborn among many brethren refers to, in the introduction, called to belong to Christ. Called to belong to Christ. Here it is. Firstborn among many brethren. We are called to be part of God's family. Also, we found that we were called to be holy. That is found in the phrase, be conformed to the image of his son. He expects us to be conformed to be like the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's supposed to be a Christ-likeness in us. As we work our way through Romans, and I, and I can't take you on a sightseeing tour of each chapter, so let me just arrive at the conclusion of the first premise, and that's found in Romans chapter 12, if you turn there. Romans 12, starting in verse 1. I beseech you therefore, the therefore is based on everything that proceeds in the first 11 chapters. But the therefore is ultimately based upon the power that is given to us through the Holy Spirit to live for God. How he has freed us from the bondage of sin so that we can now serve him. I appeal to you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Notice the next word, holy and acceptable to God. We are to be presenting our bodies. Earlier in Romans, it said, don't present your bodies for wickedness, but present your bodies for righteousness. We are in our worship to be presenting our physical bodies, our hands, our feet, our minds, our actions. We are to be presenting them to God holy. Verse 1, which is your spiritual worship, which King James says, which is your reasonable worship. It is, uh, be not uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies, living inside your holy, except God, which is your reasonable service, is the King James. Reasonable service, reasonable worship, spiritual worship. This is what spirituality is. Now notice verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed. Be transformed. Be different than this world. Because God has called you to be holy. God has given you the ability to be holy. So be holy. By the renewal of your mind. And we'll look at that in much greater detail. My point to you is that it is clear in the book of Romans that we are called not just to believe in Jesus and accept a positional holiness and then live any way we want. That's not the gospel. The gospel is God takes you as you are. God takes you as you are. The gospel is not God takes you as you are so you continue to live you as you are. God takes you as you are so that now you can live a different life to the honor and glory of God. To be set free from the bondage. That's why I included 1 Peter this morning in our call to worship which says specifically but as he who is called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Makes it absolutely clear what we're talking about. It's talking about our activities. Be holy in your conduct. That is a universal thought. But you see, there's tremendous theological problems when you start talking about a gospel that simply offers forgiveness 
with no transformation of heart or life. That calls on you to simply ask Jesus to take you to heaven with no concern at all about unholiness or unrighteousness. That's why that gospel doesn't require repentance. That's, people don't even have to be sorry for their sins. People don't even have to want to be free from their sins. They simply don't want to be having to pay the penalty for their sins. The gospel isn't simply accept Jesus so you can be forgiven the penalty of your sins. The gospel is receive Jesus so you can be free from the penalty of your sin, you can be free from the power of your sin, and ultimately you're gonna be free from the presence of your sin. You're gonna be in God, you're gonna be in eternity with God where you are going to be sinless, not just positionally, not just, okay, we're all in eternity forgiven, and we're robbing from each other, we're lying to each other, we're stealing from each other, no. We are in eternity a holy people. Forgiven and transformed. And that's the gospel. That's what God intended. That is the primary focus of the gospel. That's why so many people wonder, you know, what is life all about? I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Now I'm just waiting to go to heaven. And when I am in heaven, what am I going to do there? The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. It's a truncated message. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is coming. A kingdom in which God is going to establish here on this earth. It's going to be a new earth. There's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. And there's going to be living here in complete righteousness and holiness. And you get to be a part of that. And preparation for that kingdom is to live a life now of godliness and holiness of committing yourself to Jesus Christ. How do we know that that's a central theme of the book of Romans? Well, we know it by just reading through the entire book, but let me draw your attention to Romans chapter 16. The doxology. So we have the introduction in verses 1 to 7. We have the doxology beginning in verse 25. Here's the doxology. Now, to him who is able to, if you mark your Bibles, circle the word strengthen. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. So the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ is able to strengthen you, empower you, not just forgive you, but strengthen and empower you according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret in long ages, verse 26, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. God has strengthened you to bring about the obedience of faith. God has empowered you. God has enabled you. God has strengthened you. God has given you his spirit so that you can be obedient to the faith. Verse 27, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. Far too many people think that Christ came to save us as we are so that we could continue to live as we are. Christ came to save us as we are, a people dead in trespasses and sins so that we could walk in newness of life. Listen to Romans 6. What should we say then? Okay, he has just laid out the doctrine of justification, of the fact that your sins can be forgiven by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's not based upon your works, it's not based upon your goodness, it's based solely upon Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, 
the righteousness that he gives to us through faith, having concluded with that, it says, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the answer? God forbid, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ was dead and buried and rose again and conquered sin so that we could walk in newness of life. A transformed people. A people living to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. We have a wonderful privilege of declaring a gospel that not only brings about forgiveness for eternity, but also brings about deliverance from the power of sin. In the book of Romans, chapter 7, you see we've got these snippets. Romans 7, Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul says, I am wretched, I am miserable. Who is going to deliver me from my sinfulness? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is Jesus Christ that delivers us from that bondage of sinfulness. So we can live for him. That's the gospel. But you see, there are many, many people who don't want to be delivered from their bondage of sinfulness. There are a host of people who don't hunger, who don't want to repent, who don't recognize what their sin is doing to themselves, to their families, or to God. They could care less. The gospel is not, you can care less and still go to heaven. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that there is a way for you to be delivered from your sin. There is a way for you to overcome. There is a way for you to conquer. Now, not perfectly by any means. But we can make strides. And the great gospel is that one day, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we really will be completely holy. Not just viewed as holy, we will be holy. We'll be different. We'll be changed. We'll be sinless. Not just in position, but objectively. Why has God called you to a life of holiness? For his name's sake. To bring honor and glory to God. We're talking about very basic things here, people. We're talking about theology 101. What does God want from you? What does God want for you? What's God's desire for your life? I believe if you took a poll and ask people, why did God save you? What does God want for your life? Most people would say, God wants me to be happy. God wants me to be fulfilled. And so whatever brings me that happiness must be good. Whatever brings that fulfillment, it must be good. Whatever makes me unhappy, that can't be the will of God. That, that can't be what God wants for my life. What God wants from us is holiness. What God wants from us is righteousness. What God wants from us is submission to his authority. And sometimes that means tough things come into my life. 
That means sometimes I get sick. Sometimes I get aches and pains. Sometimes people don't treat me the way that I want to be treated. But we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to conform us to the image of his Son. His Son, who was not called to a life of pleasure, whose God's purpose for his life was not simply to be happy. God's purpose for his son was to do his will. Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O God. At the greatest moment of temptation in Jesus' life, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was his prayer, not my will, but yours be done. We're called to be conformed to that image. Not my will, not my pleasure, not my delight. What you want for my life, what is going to best serve you? What is going to bring the greatest glory to you? The gospel is about bringing glory to God. It's not a man-centered gospel. It's a gospel of the kingdom. That difference, I can't tell you how important that is. And as we work our way through the book of Romans, I think you're going to understand more clearly how different that is is and how important that difference is. But just understand that for many people, the gospel that's being presented is quite different than the gospel that's outlined in the book of Romans. And it explains why Christendom is the way it is today. For people are professing Jesus as Lord that have no intention whatsoever of bringing their lives under his authority. They just don't want to go to hell. Well, the gospel is, yes, wonderfully, you can be forgiven your sins if you confess your sins. To confess is to say the same thing about If you say the same thing about your sins that God says about your sins, you can be saved. That they are sin, that they are wrong, that they need to be repented of, they need to be forgiven. They do dishonor God. Lord, forgive me so that I can be saved. Saved and be in your presence, saved and delivered from this wretchedness that I am. That I can live a different life. That I can be transformed to your glory to your praise. Let's pray. Almighty God, help us. Help us as your people, as those who have believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we understand that though we have different gifts, though that we have different talents and abilities that we looked at last week, Lord, there is one universal calling for every single person that names the name of Christ. There is one duty that everyone in this room has if they name the name of Christ. And that is to be holy. Lord, may we get serious about living holy lives. May we understand holiness not simply in terms of what will bring us happiness or joy. We ought to live our lives the right way so that we can have better marriages. We ought to live our lives the right way so that we can be happier. We ought to live our lives the right way so that we can be a good example. Oh, Lord, help us to understand that we live holy lives ultimately for your glory. And that your name is spoken against when Christians 
do not live godly lives. Your name is dishonored. Your authority is questioned. Your goodness is held in contempt. Oh Lord, help us to be serious about living lives that please you. And when we sin, may our grief be that we have failed to honor you the way that you deserve. Oh Lord, help us to see ourselves as people who are not our own, we're bought with a price. Lord, we belong to you. What a great, great truth that is. Firstborn among many brethren, called to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be so conformed. Thank you for the power of your spirit. Lord, may that be our desire. May that be our prayer. May that be our intent. May that be our resolve. May that be our longing to be conformed more and more to the image of the Lord Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.